Our main speaker today is James uh, Higgins uh, from uh, RDH Building Science. He's a building science technologist uh, who works uh, across different areas uh, in the industry, including the uh, building science research with building science laboratories, uh, and also in the design and construction of high performance enclosures. Uh, so he has been uh, a known name in the scene uh, in the Vancouver area in the lower mainland. Uh, some of his uh, latest contributions and projects include the uh, Brock Commons building uh, on the UBC campus, uh, which I'm sure you've heard about. It's a very exciting project. So he's going to tell us more about his experience and his knowledge on the uh, again design, installation, and testing of uh, air barrier systems. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over uh, to James uh, for his presentation. James, take it away, please. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thanks very much for, for joining us. We, uh, we've got a lot to cover, so I'll get right into it. So we're talking about building air tightness, talking about the practices, the best practices for design and installation and testing. Now, I, uh, I've got a lot of cool stuff here, but I want to make sure that we're all on the same page when it comes to, to air tightness. Even if this isn't the first time you've heard about this, obviously with the step code coming in, there's been a lot of discussion about building air tightness, but it's something that's near and dear to my heart. It uh, plays a big role in, in building performance. And so uh, I love being able to share the information here about, about this, uh, this concept. Quick overview. We're going to talk about the air tightness measurement, what it actually means, some of the basics around what the air barrier is, the best practices, we'll get right into it. You know, what you're here for, you want to learn about the right way to do things. Some of the materials, accessories, the various components about uh, that, that go into the air barrier. I'll have one example that really helps me illustrate what I'm, what I'm sharing. Uh, it goes from, you know, conceptual level really to the, to the boots on the ground approach with what, what we're actually doing on site. Quick note on, uh, construction and quality control, and then obviously the testing, um, what you may be involved with, what your energy advisor will be doing as well. So some basics for air tightness. When we're in the context of the part nine building, we're dealing with a, uh, a measurement known as ACH or air changes per hour. And so it's essentially a, a measurement of the volume of air that moves through the building during the test you know, under the test pressure of 50 pascals, which again, the ACH 50. So this number, it's funny, there's a couple of parallels right off the bat, there's a couple of parallels with golf. And I like this parallel to say that the lower, the better, the lower the score, the better. Okay, we'll leave it at that for now. With the step code, we have these, uh, well, descending levels of air tightness, increased air tightness from, you know, step two, three, four, five. And, uh, and hitting these targets is a huge, it plays a huge role in hitting the energy targets for each of these steps. I'm not going to get too much more into the actual energy step code metrics. Obviously, that's a lot of, there's information there you can, you can find online and obviously in this, uh, in this webinar. Um, but to quickly illustrate the numbers here, you see there, step three, 2.5 ACH 50. That means that over the course of an hour, you would have transferred two and a half times the volume of the building uh, at the test pressure. Now, this doesn't mean that a test lasts an hour, but it does tell you that, you know, that's how much air is able to move through the building um, through, through its enclosure. On the other hand, stepping down one to 1 1.5, you have less airflow, less volume. So that's just a quick illustration of the, the concept for this ACH 50 number. So that's a huge, plays a huge role in the step code compliance, obviously. Another thing to quickly point out with compliance with step code, there actually is a requirement to note, you know, what the air barrier system is and, um, and besides obviously the target for the number. So you're, you have to know what the air barrier is and you have to know what the number that, you, you know, the number that you're trying to hit. There's all kinds of different compliance pathways, I'm not getting into it, but, but the, the goal is to make the building airtight and that's why you're here, obviously. And so. Some of the air barrier basics. Let's see. Well, this is a wall example. Um, just a simple section of a wall. It's obviously got some extreme insulation. I'm not going to get into that too much, but 
the air barrier itself is the layer that controls the airflow. And it, it has, there's a, quite a few options for what that material, what that system is. It's not necessarily the interior polyethylene as maybe some, most of us are used to. It could be an exterior sheathing membrane, you know, a synthetic membrane that's airtight. It could also be a number of other materials, including even, you know, rigid airtight insulation, wood, all kinds of different ways. My goal is to simplify the discussion today. So what I'm pointing out is the air barrier at the exterior face of the sheathing membrane. We'll, we'll talk about why, uh, why I, I've assumed that. So it's the sheathing membrane and it's essentially, you know, to put it simply, it's the, it's the synthetic sheathing uh, membrane like, uh, like Tyvek or Typar, airtight, sealed around its edges. And at, obviously at penetrations. But the air barrier is actually more than that. So it's more than just one line on a drawing here. It's, it's a combination of the components, the accessories, the materials coming together, all sealed and airtight to create the airtight enclosure all the way around the building. And so, you know, the question is, well, is it, is it really all the way around? Is it really in, entirely continuous? In fact, that is the goal. And, a, and another quick illustration here to say, do, do I need to hit, uh, do, you know, do I need to hit these air tightness targets? Don't I need my building to breathe? Well, there's a lot of, uh, you know, building science physics discussion around that question, but put it simply, we definitely need airflow into our building and through our building, but we need to be able to control that. And so a, a building that doesn't have air tightness is prone to all kinds of issues um, and compared to a building that's got, you know, a fully continuous air barrier from top to bottom, you know, floor, wall, ceiling. And, uh, and we've seen it, well, in, in, in summers past and even recently, you know, uh, potential biohazards and, uh, and uh, forest fire smoke. A building that's not airtight that can't control the ventilation and, and in fact also filter it is, uh, again, prone to, to all kinds of issues. But of course, from an energy step code perspective, we're talking about energy preservation and the fact that airflow is a huge waste of energy if we're not able to control it. Another quick, another quick example of air tightness to picture maybe in your head. It is, it is the goal is to make it as, as continuous as a balloon, of course, with some ventilation to make sure that we can control, you know, make, keep things comfortable in there and, uh, perhaps a window or two, <laughs> but I, I like this to show, you know, I, I am picturing a, a green air barrier <clears throat> all the way around the building. So some best practices for achieving this airtight air barrier around the entire building. Well, five keys, I think, to an airtight building. The first one is this concept separating the framing work from the air barrier components. This is the term the kind of termed decoupling the steps in the building process so that we're not trying to include various enclosure components while we're still putting the building together, you know, at the framing stage. <clears throat> and we know that the framing stage has to happen fast. We want to get a roof on this. We want to get lockup. <clears throat> and so if we have to try and integrate air barrier details, you know, pre-stripping, and, and polyethylene, it can become a bit cumbersome. So if we can, if we can simplify our air tightness approach, and you'll see this in an example, uh, then, then it really, really lends itself to building air tightness overall, while still point number two, keeping the construction sequencing, you know, somewhat conventional. And this is a, with, you know, with a cost consciousness so that we, we aren't re reinventing the wood frame building wheel. Third one, relying on reviewable inspectable airtight approaches you know tapes and seals that we can see not blind seals or inferred seals that are just you know placed behind large components that can never be viewed again it does work and it can work but it's very uh, it's, it's unreliable and that's just uh, you know that this is a the concept of getting to a point where we know we can hit air tightness targets and we're ready for increased air tightness targets and, and that is you know being future ready uh, to reiterate, simple and buildable, you know, practicing it on site, maybe some mock-ups, but making sure we can do it. And as I said, future ready for the next step that becomes the code minimum uh, and the next step after that without having to re reinvent our air tightness approach every time. Further to that, for the designers and builders, some of the key roles. With the designer, we want to show all of the all of the air barrier components and, and, and actually indicate it on the plans and the details. 
and it if you're not sure if it needs a detail it probably does it's worth the effort there's all kinds of guidance out there obviously for what to do and, and how to transition but showing it on paper really helps us to visualize it obviously <clears throat> on site there's a concept of the air boss and it's a simplified term but essentially uh, a role that maybe the site superintendent takes to actually keep track of the building or tightness, the penetrations, the materials, um, subcontractors, you know, managing where holes are, are put in, in the building through the air barrier, coordinating. And then obviously during the test, especially the mid-construction test, viewing what the issues are, if there are any, having a plan overall for the air tightness. So this, this air boss really helps to, to manage the efforts on site few key concepts, you know, checking the specs, the compatibility with the, with the building materials, manufacturer's instructions, TBV, you know, trust that it's been done, but still verify. Managing the substrate, that's the biggest one we see, you know, holes are put through the building every single day that a substrate is on site, putting in services, et cetera. So we have to manage that. Then obviously all of the typical, you know, documentation, sequencing, making sure everything is done properly. What we found through our research uh, and, and in general that, you know, with our view of the industry, we see that when there is an air boss, when there is somebody on site who is reviewing it, who they know they have to answer to, essentially, to say this is how the air tightness is maintained, then we know that we can hit those air tightness targets. And it, it doesn't take very much extra effort, you know, as long as someone cares. With the sub trades, there's a few, as I noted, a few key sub trades that are really prone to making all kinds of penetrations in the building enclosure. Obviously, from from the framing stage, if there is in fact some pre strip, and we have to be very clear on what that's trying, what what that what we're trying to achieve with that. It's not just a question of laying out poly and tacking it in between plates anymore. We have to be confident that that it's uh, it's continuous. Obviously, electrical, plumbing, HVAC. You know, holes galore through the through above grade, below grade. Uh, it, it, if we keep the concept in mind to say, if a sub trade isn't allowed to make a hole in the enclosure without a review, then we know we can at least see where it's going and what we have to manage. The installation of poly drywall, and so it depends on your air barrier approach, but uh, but understanding you know the role that that the, this sub trade plays. And then, of course, cladding over top of, well, in our case, the air barrier on the outside, uh, making sure that we're not making huge cuts and slashes in our membrane, besides from, you know, air tightness, other durability concerns as well. So, a quality control checklist, managing sub trades, these are all really key keys to the building air tightness. Uh, a quick little image there, actually, you know, signs posted all over the building that say this is an airtight building. Um, adding it to the COVID signs, I'm sure, but uh, right, maybe right beside it to say, don't put a hole in the air barrier uh, unless you it's been reviewed. Then it helps to to keep thing keep track of things. Now back to this interior air barrier approach with the typical poly. I I don't really want to disparage it too much because, in fact, with the right amount, you know, with with effort and and the right detailing, it can work, but it's not. Not necessarily the simplest, and I would argue certainly not scalable and future ready for the higher performance air tightness that, that we're on track for with the step code, right? So we have to have a plan and we have are dealing with all kinds of framing, interior components, penetrations, you know, having a plan for all of these different areas, uh, you know, it's potentially difficult to keep track of. But that doesn't mean that it doesn't get hard when we're on the outside. In some cases, if we're not planning ahead, it's the same issue. We have to have a plan for the pre-stripping if we're going behind various exterior components, potentially, you know, complex framing, all kinds of junctions that we have to, to air seal around. This is more of a, a broad discussion, but but simplifying the building form or at least the enclosure form in some ways really will help to, to improve air tightness, um, you know, 50 different corners and roof junctions are, are, are going to take a lot of effort, no matter what your air barrier approach is. So from our perspective, the exterior sheathing is a, is a, is a pretty good substrate to start our air barrier concept. 
And in fact, you know, besides the, the conceptual details and the drawings, we, we are involved in the mock-ups. This is an example here at BCIT. We're all, all kinds of effort to kind of practice air tightness approaches, see what works, test it. We even build, you know, mini wall mock-ups of different systems. Uh, and we can kind of get the hands-on view of, of each of these details. I would recommend, you know, if you got your own little shed to build a mock-up of the different air tightness approaches, by all means, try out different membranes, try different things. Kind of like golf, again, you, you, you have to practice to, to make it work. And one bad hole and it can ruin your game. Okay, anyways, that's all I'll say about golf. So what are the materials we're using here on the outside? Well, PCBC 925 and 936 all have, uh, they both have different definitions and, and notes about the air barrier itself, but it, the materials intended to provide the principal resistance to air leakage. But it's not just that membrane, right? It's not just that sheathing membrane in this example. It's a combination of all of the accessories and the components that that really are the seal for this material material so we're talking about the tapes the sealant and the spray foam and besides every other type of uh, you know accessory that helps us keep things airtight but also the components so we are making sure that the walls uh, sorry the windows and the doors that are going into our walls are in fact you know the correct air tightness and sealed properly at the perimeter I'm not going to get too much into detail about this, but you know, this is really to illustrate that we're, we're reviewing the entire enclosure from top to bottom. You'll see some more examples, roofs, uh, ceiling, plane, floors as well. That's what that perimeter seal here, in this case, uh, back rod and sealant. Well, I've shown a bunch of the quick examples, tons more resources from BC Housing, and I'd recommend at least these two guides, the Illustrated Guide to Achieving Air Tightness, Airtight Buildings, and the BC Energy SEPCO Builder Guide, uh, both available from BC Housing, authored by RDH, by me and a bunch of other guys here, which is great to get the, the technical knowledge into a, uh, an accessible guide. It's highly illustrative, very useful, if I do say so myself. Okay, so we have to. We know what we're using more or less. We have to plan our building air tightness and make sure that it works on site. We're talking about top to bottom, like I said ceilings, junctions, you know, walls, rim joists, all the way down to below grade. And uh, I can say that, you know, I'm reporting from my basement, North Delta, we finished this house last year, fairly airtight. And, uh, and it took a fair bit of effort, again, top to bottom, sealing and taping and making sure that it, that it worked out. This isn't necessarily a, a huge undertaking with the practice that we know we'll get after you know our first few buildings you could say the hardest building to make airtight is the first building you're trying to make airtight after that you know it's just a question of uh, standardizing the approach the example here the rim joist so there's this is a really great kind of snapshot of the the different airtightness approaches at one key location uh, and it, it helps us to kind of illustrate the concepts here but obviously we're, we're used to this you know, typical platform framing. Uh, it, you may have sheathing that in, it extends in front of the rim joist, but this is just a simplified view of it. We have the platform framing on top of our walls uh, with potentially double, you, know, you can see there there's a concrete topping, but you can ignore that. That depends on what, what's going on. But regardless, lots of different wood components coming together. Now at the framing stage, if this team can proceed without having to deal with the air barrier, that's the goal. So far in a lot of uh, projects, the interior air barrier with interior seal uh, using spray foam or other approaches between rim, you know, at the rim joist between floor joists is doable. But again, it's interfacing with a lot of wood and our wood has to also be sealed between, you know, the different plates to make sure that it can achieve the continuity from one floor to the next. So some quick examples here, you know, a fully spray foam rim joist, including obviously spray foam potentially within the wall, uh, solid uh, foam board with spray foam around the perimeter or other type of sealant also can work. You can see though that I've also highlighted in green here, you know, the, uh, the wood is actually part of the air barrier at this point. 
So we have to be careful to make sure that we're, you know, that we're actually using the right materials to adhere to that wood. A few other approaches inside sealed sheathing, a higher end pro approach. And then the, the conventional typical, you know, interior sealed polyethylene with, of course, the rim joist seal. Fine, works. Uh, again, fair bit of effort. This is the simplest view. You, we haven't shown the bathtub that you have to seal around, the stair treads that are have that have to go onto these exterior walls potentially and have to be pre-stripped. There's a lot to it. One quick note on on further pre-stripping as part of the framing. We've seen this before. It's not as common, but pre-stripping around our floor joists. Uh, quite a lot of effort. You can see in this picture, you know, are we the effort to seal it during the framing stage? It, it's it's quite a lot, and it probably isn't going to happen. And then on the other hand, if we move it all the way out to the exterior face of the sheathing and other framing, then we have you know a kind of a a blank palette to make our air barrier work. Some more quick examples on the outside, again from top to bottom, straight down. In this example, at least, we could uh, we could look at tape sheathing. That's in fact the the approach that I use. I use a, a, a tape over top of my plywood, and it works fairly well. Very you know inspectable. I can review all of the joints. I also have a good a good solid substrate to seal to. I can you know I can tape and seal to my plywood. A more proprietary approach: sealed uh, insulation. Not as common here. We know that there's some you know important considerations with the use of airtight uh, impermeable foam on the outside. Liquid applied, even a higher end approach, obviously not as common. And then, of course, the conventional sealed synthetic airtight sheathing membrane that in this case is also vapor permeable. So we're not worried about trapping moisture. So if we zoom into this, you know, we're, we're, while we're sealing all of the joints and, and penetrations. If we zoom into some more of this detailing to think about de even further decoupling. So I'm, I've finished framing and now I'm dealing with the air barrier. But in fact, I also have to deal with you know, water penetration control. This is a schematic illustration, and I want to make sure that I'm, you know, that you're seeing this uh, conceptually, and I know it works on site. We, we've completed it, but there are some considerations, especially for the conventional code compliance approach for water control. But I do want to show it here as an example. In terms of decoupling water control and our through wall flashings with the air tightness. So you can see we have to, you know, obviously lap are flashing under that uh, membrane, which at this point is our air barrier. But if we're not careful, we could start to, well, cut, potentially open up the, the, the membrane and, and reduce the air tightness if it's not properly sealed. So when we are integrating our flashing, we're having to make sure that actually the metal is part of the air barrier and it's properly you know, lapped underneath there, underneath our membrane, taped to that synthetic sheathing membrane. And then the synthetic sheathing membrane on top of that is taped to the flashing. Quite a lot to it doable, but it means that there's more and more transitions that we have to deal with. On the other hand, this concept of a taped through wall flashing, uh, again, being careful with how it's applied and, and exposure and water control, but we, we essentially decouple that portion of the water control from our air barrier membrane. And you can see there, it's directly on the face. We're dealing with you know, the right materials. In fact, uh, some, some of the typical tapes can do this, but it's, technically not a reverse lap. And I wanted to point this out. There's a term here, reverse lap for when we have exposed top edges. I wanted to say that it's, it's, you know, the membrane and even, you know, the air barrier, obviously water control behind this flashing is still continuous because we're able to just run our sheet up, but then we have, you know, the, the correct lapping and, and, and sealing at the top edge of this flashing, just to be certain there's different approaches with membranes and tapes. I'm not going to get too much more into that, but you can see here this concept of decoupling to say, I want to achieve my air barrier, considering it mo moisture control and other, other, you know, factors, but having that occur and making sure that that's airtight before we get to other stages, it also lends itself quite well to what we'll get to with a mid construction air tightness test to, to actually see that we're on track before other components have, have been installed. To zoom back out away from this wall. You can obviously get to questions about this concept and further and, and other air tightness approaches, but back out from the wall here, some more examples. Again, you can see that green highlighting of the materials at the ceiling, a few different approaches. The conventional, you know, polyethylene approach can work, still works. We have to be careful, um, making sure that our penetrations are, are properly sealed. There's an example here on the far right to, to show a, a service cavity where 
It's also in, you know, combined with a different air tightness approach, but you could do it with poly where you actually run services in a, in a service cavity beneath your ceiling membrane so that we can uh, avoid the penetrations, especially, you know, the pot lights and the, and all of the different electrical penetrations that go through the ceiling. Some more details, roof to wall here. This is an interesting issue in that we have, you know, the conventional attic approach with our framing. We do have to interface if we're going from the outside face of the, of the wall to the ceiling and we have to transition through. So the concept of decoupling in, involves achieving the air barrier on the outside of our framing and not having to, as shown here on the, on the, the two uh, left side thumbnails, some, some pre-stripping or pre-sealant um, during the framing that, that might be hard to, to actually achieve compared to a higher end approach with some tape on the top of our a pl uh, top plate so that we can use that as the air barrier, but also apply all of this after the fact. And then the far right there, it's just a, a thumbnail of the, the exterior, the fully exterior approach. I'm not going to get into that, but you can, can kind of consider it the, it's been termed the monopoly house approach where the membrane actually continues up and, uh, and the exterior components and, and even the overhang occurs after that. So that we have a simple air tightness membrane. And I'm not going to, not going to get too much more into that. As I noted, same thing for windows. We have a uh, perimeter sealant, a couple of different ways of doing this, but making sure that it's fully tied into our airtight windows and doors all the way around the perimeter. You can see they're installed and, and sealed. And now our window also becomes part of the air barrier down at the bottom of the wall. Quite a few different ways to do this as well. In fact, in most cases, we're likely using uh, the concrete itself. You can see highlighted green as the air barrier. If it's an interior approach or, or flip flop flopping back and forth, we do have to pre strip. But if we keep it simple, as shown on the far on the far right there, uh, you know, use the concrete and then seal to it and continue our air barrier up on the outside of the building. Down below grade. There's some interesting code implications for air tightness, you know, moisture control, even soil gas control, but a fully sealed polyethylene sheet, you know, likely a, a thicker polyethylene sheet, maybe 15 mil sealed at penetrations at perimeters that that'll do what we need to. And then again, tying to our foundation wall concrete, we're good to go. That was a pretty quick review, but I'm going to. I'm going to leave this open for some questions about, you know, depending how much time we get in here. And then quickly note here, the air tightness testing. So this isn't something that the builder or the designer is undertaking in general. And while it's possible, you know, you get your equipment to, to use, to test it out. The energy advisor or your energy modeler is the one that's, that's completing this or, or handling this side of the testing. Simply using a fan to measure airflow in and measure airflow out, as we noted off the top here and get your ACH. There's other ways of measuring air tightness as well and other metrics, but ACH is our simplest approach. Before we get to the final test, we actually do have you know, the ability to do a mid construction air tightness test. And we wanna do this, uh, well, in some cases it's very, it's mandated or at least it's uh, incentivized from the cities as you might hear to get your first built few buildings tested mid construction to see that you're on track. And it's only useful if it's basically com complete. And so that means really uh, we have our windows and doors in, it's basically lock up, but also the exterior sheathing membrane, or you're waiting until the interior approach is done, you know, polyethylene, but before drywall. If you can attend it as the builder, even the designer, see what's happening, see what numbers you're, you're getting. As part of this mid construction test, we also want to do qualitative testing. So not just the number, but actually using visual indicator for the air tightness of our building. And we see this with, you know, the most. Uh, well, our, our approach, we have a, a industrial fog generator and we blast it with fog and we can see where the, the smoke is coming out, but it could be, you know, uh, a modified vape, you know, done safely. Even, uh, some incense sticks we've seen where with enough airflow, you know, you turn your fans on and you can actually see the smoke flow through the enclosure, wherever it is, wherever there's discontinuities and having it accessible so that we can actually repair it when, you know, when we have the chance, that's where the value in this testing comes in. Uh, and so this should be, it may be available from your energy advisor. If it's not, think about maybe 
achieve, you know, getting up to speed on how to do this. Again, more guidance than some of those guides I noted off the top. At the final air tightness test, you know, we're actually dealing with quantitative air tightness testing. Uh, we are actually testing for the number and it's, uh, it's again done by our energy modeler, energy advisor. The only part where you may come in, you know, depending on how the services are offered is potentially in building preparation because we're only testing the enclosure air tightness. Depending on this, the, the approach, we may actually have to seal the intentional mechanical openings and there's different ways to do that. But generally it's, you know, done with a, a specialized tape that you seal over the interior of the vents, making sure we're at the right spot, you know, bathroom fans, kitchen hood vents, those things, again, they're not part of the enclosure, but if we don't, if, we, if we're not careful, they, they mean a lot of air leakage. It is part of the controlled ventilation, not the air barrier. In general, the conventional building is, uh, you know, it's, you're actually testing with, we call it the in-service condition. So we, we just depressurize so that the, the louvers that are already on the building uh, help keep it airtight, uh, but it may require sealing if there's a different approach used. So I've, I've, I feel I've uh, definitely breezed through a lot of this. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to make sure that, uh, that you kind of have seen, well, all of the air tightness concepts that are in my head. And I really wanna to, to get you thinking about questions now with, uh, with the time that we have left, because, uh, well, I can see I've, I've got a fair bit of time here. So, I find that in general, you know, if you can prompt the, maybe the technical discussion, I'm happy to take questions um, about what I've shown so far and some of the you know, basic air tightness approaches. If that, if that works or we can continue, I, I'm not sure if there's a, a chat as well. Let's see. Um, James, so uh, there are a couple of questions here. Great. Um, so one question we've got is, um, uh, what is the preferred exterior house wrap, Tyvek commercial, uh, mattress vest, zip sheeting, question mark? Perfect question. High level and, and it helps us to, to dive back into some of the, the drawings I showed here. Uh, let me just make sure I've got that here. I will, yeah, go back to that drawing. So yes. Uh, question about the sheathing membrane on the outside. So when we're dealing with the exterior sheathing membrane, we are making sure, and you got an image there of a Tyvek on that, in that example, but I'll just quickly go back here. The exterior sheathing membrane has to be appropriately airtight, moisture resistant, durable. And now the fact is that um, I can say, you know, Tyvek home wrap, it really does check off all the boxes. I'm not paid by Tyvek, and in fact, this isn't this is, you know it's not intended as a as a endorsement, but to say that it it hits all the marks for the characteristics we want from our exterior air barrier. It's permeable, it's airtight, relatively durable. We know that there are tapes that seal to it quite well. You know that the tuck tape or even the actual Tyvek tape. Um, they uh, we're, we're pretty confident in, in that, you know, the DuPont Tyvek approach, but when we are dealing with potentially, you know, more exposed conditions or, or bigger loads, we, we do jump to maybe more of a commercial product, um, and, you know, into commercial Tyvek or, or even some other types like self adhered, uh, Sega is one of them. Um, the, the fact is though, that, you know, the air tightness approach on the outside, it really, uh, it, it's, it's kind of expandable to the different materials and systems because, uh, because, you know, we know that if we're having to adjust it, we're still using the exterior as our substrate. And, um, and, you know, the interesting thing of course, is that we're trying to make our exterior watertight anyways. So we're putting a fair bit of effort into, you know, taping vertical joints already, especially when it comes to Tyvek that you know, the extra step to seal the horizontal joints now, you know, basically gets us there. And we were already halfway there anyways. On the flip side, on the interior, 
obviously, you know, the effort involved with sealing with polyethylene, it's all doable, but we having to make sure that it's quite airtight. And, uh, and if we, you know, if we aren't having to make that airtight in, instead, and we use it on the outside, then there's some options for simplifying the inside as a trade-off. I'm not sure if that fully answered the question, but I know that, you know, the, the real answer for what material you're using is, is it depends. And I hate that, you know, that that's almost always the answer. I do, I, you know, I do like the other approaches, especially uh, potentially zip sheathing because it, it takes one less step off. There's others out there as well. In fact, it doesn't have to be a proprietary system, but it's, once you've got your sheathing on there, you just have to tape it. Now, what I find with that is you have to make sure there aren't too many joints, you know, when you're framing the, the building and you have 500 sheets of, of sheathing and all, you know, uh, jigsaw together or sorry, yeah, jigsaw puzzle together. Uh, it might be a bit difficult, but with larger spans, it, it, it can work and you, you use the right tape. Uh, got another question. Uh, with regard to the, uh, the mid construction, uh, test, what is a good number to get? I think they're referring to ACH. Well, it really depends on the step. So if, theoretically you, with a complete air barrier, even if interior uh, drywall is not on, or even when, when, you know, cladding is not on, but we have it sealed. Um, we, we should be very much approaching the target ACH, depending on the step that we're at, right? 3, 2.5, 2, 1.5. We want to be careful with mid construction testing that we're not, um, you know, overstressing the air barrier, because it may be that if we start to, to pull in the wrong direction, then you, you can start to pull things out, whereas they would have normally been behind, you know, a, a support for that air barrier. But no, it's, um, you know, from my perspective, regardless of the step, shooting for the lowest number possible. And um, if you see that you're, well, in these first few steps, if you're at, at 3 or 2.5, you're really on the right track. Um, a, another point with that is to say, you know, again, with one or two bad holes, with something that's not properly sealed, the amount of airflow, it's, it's really surprising how much it can ruin the air tightness result. So if you can be go around to look at if there are leakage points and seal them up, you can actually, you can see that number go down, you know, on the fly. It doesn't take, it doesn't, it's all, often it's calculated while the test is going and you can see that number go down. Uh, so that's a really good use of the mid construction test. Another question. Uh, most often exterior wrap is stapled on and all the, all the joints are taped. Does the stapling compromise the air tightness? If so, what is the best practice? Well, good question again. Uh, yes, simply put a staple through, you know, the, the airtight barrier will lead to some small amount of air leakage. Uh, but on the other hand, it's generally small. Generally, we see that, you know, our focus on overall air tightness comes to the, the large holes, the transitions, and these staples aren't, at least for the, the you know, the, the numbers that we're dealing with for the, the first few steps of the step code, uh, it's, it's not a factor. And on, on, you know, by the same point, you know, while polyethylene is sealed at its perimeters on the inside, we do the same thing when we attach everything on the inside, like the, the you know, the drywall, um, thousands of screws, it's, it's obviously sandwiched. The same thing occurs with the, with the sheeting membrane. What you see in this example, actually on your, your screen there is, is actually uh, staple caps. We, we've seen this, it, they work fairly well, basically a little perimeter gasket around our staples and you, you have the right, you know, you use the right um, tack stapler so that you can actually, you know, do it all at once. You're not adding that or anything. Um, and then the next step out from that is to avoid staples. And that means, you know, an adhered approach, which, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the next step up in terms of air tightness and it avoids that. Obviously, being careful not to put penetrations in it later, with uh, with the other attachment, you know, making sure that it's it's sealed and it's behind uh, strapping, for example. Uh, next question: uh, Please elaborate on the taped top plate for transitioning the exterior air barrier into the ceiling. Absolutely. So let me just make sure I've got this here. I'm going to make sure I can control my. There we go. Um, I will go through here. Let's see. Yeah. Let me just make sure I've got this. So this detail, I apologize for if you're getting a little dizzy and 
flying through these slides. This tape top plate approach is uh, something that we've kind of happened upon and it uses a lot of the same concepts that maybe we're used to where we're actually you know, transitioning through that top plate. When we have an interior sealing membrane, we have to make sure that we have a positive seal across there. But the old ways, well, the, the conventional ways use uh, blind seals essentially. What we do here is that uh, we actually use a compatible tape around our top plates at its joints and between the sheathing and the top plate, well, the top surface of the top plate, including at the, um, you know, the dividing walls. So what we're trying to do, and in fact, you know, generally we're dealing with top plates all the way along. It's there, you know, they're 10, 12, well, maybe eight feet, but they're, they're, they're in longer sections. So we're just sealing at the ends of each of these plates and then at the sides. And so what that does is uh, with the right tape, we're now making that, that top plate, the airtight material. So that if we have penetrations through a top plate, you know, including plumbing stacks, we just have to seal to that top plate compared to, as I showed off the top, if we have to make a hole in our top plate and we're just using a poly pre-strip, then we have to be, you know, we have to drill right through that poly pre-strip that's between the plates. And now how do I seal to that? How do I get down to that poly? Whereas if it's just at the top surface, then I know that I, you know, I can see my air barrier essentially. And what this takes is basically, you know, one, let's say one day to put it simply between when our walls are all finished and when the trusses are being flown in. Now, what it does is keeps that wood as our substrate, you know, for attachment. And if we're having to support ourselves, hopefully not walking on these top plates, but essentially at least not, you know, not having to add a membrane or, or, or something slippery on top, but it's just taped at, at intermittent tape. And, um, and then what we can do is complete that, have the trusses come in, and then we have a nice substrate to tape our polyethylene to on the inside. So we can go around and we can tape to the top plate on the inside with our sealing poly and on the outside with our sheathing membrane tape to the top plate as well. Now, what I've shown, it's not indicated, but obviously it's not the typical blue or red tapes. You know, the, the, the conventional sheathing tapes aren't necessarily going to cut it, especially when it comes to wet wood. What we see for this is um, several rolls of uh, a higher end acrylic tape, you know, including SEGA. I know when I see SEGA, you, you wince from the cost implications, but again, it's, we're dealing with, you know, the trade off of air tightness for, like I said, several rolls of, of SEGA tape sticks to wood, sticks to wet wood. It's incredible. Again, that's what I did here in this building. It worked quite well. You know, I, I, I didn't do any of the framing. In fact, I came in, you know, in the evening, taped the top plates before the trusses came in the next day, all done. Didn't have to sort out polyethylene pre-stripping while I was framing. And, um, and it kept things relatively simple after that. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, I, I recommend it. Well, you can, you know, you'll see here, you can reach out. Um, but there is guidance on that in, uh, in a lot of the BC housing guides as well on, on that approach. This, uh, this might be uh, a question in the same line that says, James, as designers, we sometimes need different details or ideas for details. Is there a place we can go for ideas or a library of such details for wood frame? Yes. So right now, I would say the best option for um, Illustrating the air tightness approaches and the different ways of doing this is actually the step code builder guide to start. You can get a kind of some context for the air tightness we're trying to achieve. Um, and then the building enclosure design guide from BC housing as well. Um, also uh, authored by RDH. There's at least a hundred details in there, different approaches, interior sheathing, uh, sorry, interior polyethylene exterior. Uh, tons of details, tons of transitions and penetrations. Lastly, um, the LEAP program, L-E-E-P from Enercan, they are just in the process of finalizing four, again, highly illustrative guides that really dive into different approaches and they have you know, a full set of details at the end. I, I, I'm hoping they're published very soon and I'll try and share with at least you know, the hosts here where that's coming from <clears throat> as this stuff comes online. Okay, we've got uh, we've got lots of questions coming in, so um, uh, maybe we can get just rapid fire, and we'll see if we can get through all of them. Uh, given so say, the, what, what kind of time we're going to finish at nine thirty? Is that is that work still? We've got about you know ten more minutes or so. Got, got, yeah, uh, 
uh, Zafir, is that correct? I think we're, yeah, we've got about another 10 minutes. Um, so, uh, given the amount of tape and caulk required, is an interior air barrier system durable? Is all of that tape going to last the lifetime of the frame? We know that the materials that go inside um, are well protected, and I've pulled apart old, old buildings where the sealant, you know, that, that acoustic seal on the inside is fully functioning, still very tacky. Uh, you know, it, it's not seeing any loads. If, on the other hand, the outside, it's the same issue. Well, it's the same, the same thing is that it's protected. We, we've seen Tyvek uh, with red tape. The tape is still pulling the phaser off. It's stuck and it's flexible. It's incredible. We have to make sure that it's not exposed before cladding goes on for too long. You know, there are obviously materials that are very much um, susceptible to UV degradation. But both of them, you know, interior and exterior, we know from our experience that, you know, with the right materials, it, uh, I'm not worried about, um, uh, about the degradation um, in, in, in the most, you know, most climates, at least in most buildings. Okay. What is the advantage to taping the sheathing joints versus just taping the air barrier where it would seem you get a better seal with tape anyways? Well, this isn't using necessarily blue or red tape, you know, to put it simply tuck tape, but on if we're dealing with the sheathing what we find is that if we use that as the air barrier then we can achieve an air barrier before the the extra membranes go on highly viewable you know we can actually see our joints in fact it's the approach i use here where i you know like i said i put put sega tape at the joints of all of my plywood joints um, and and zip sheathing obviously offers a, a, a product as well but the main benefit is that it gives us a solid substrate that is now its own section you know I don't have to worry about whether it's interfacing with flashing because it's not part of the water control. And I don't have to worry about whether there's interior components because it's, it's on the outside of the building. Once I have that complete, now I can just, you know, just put on any type of water control membrane. I don't have to worry about whether that's airtight. I can lap it as needed. There's a lot more flexibility um, with, with the water control portion, you know, especially like flashing and other, other components. So that's one of the main reasons it, you know, if you are able to plan properly, you can, you can optimize it to, to save yourself time and, and effort for sure. Um, you have to make sure you have the right materials, but uh, like I said it's, it's, uh, it's emerging and it's been used you know, in, in different high performance buildings for, for a bit of time. What is the best way to air seal an attached garage when using an external air barrier? Yeah, that's, that's probably the, 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 the key for when we have pre-stripping and, and planning. So those types of, extra framing the, the garage it's considered semi-conditioned space but it's not part of the enclosure you know when we draw our floor plan we want to make sure that we have our air barrier continuing behind our garage we have an airtight door into the inside um what what we see as the 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 simplest approach is to take one step and this is again where we do have to pre-strip take one step where before the the, the studs that, you know, the wall studs that go up against the exterior sheathing that's already there. In general, our garage wall is, is often sheathed as well, right? Because it's, you know, it's from seismic reasons and others that we use that as a substrate to make it as airtight as possible. Um, at, again, just at those at those portions. It's the same for, for supported balconies and other components. A pre-strip membrane behind there as continuous, you know, one continuous membrane, you know, a big sheet of Tyvek that can go all the way across that we can reach it from either side of our garage including at the interior face where we're having to seal. If that's not possible, then it really comes down to some, some intricate sealing across the actual wood components. And, and I find that, you know, if I have, again, a roll of, of a high quality acrylic tape or sealant that I can make sure I, you know, I can adhere to the wood, then I may actually use the wood at the, you know, at the portions that are touching our, my, my enclosure and, and add those to the air barrier, essentially making those part of the air tightness approach. Um, it, it gets complicated if we have to do that at, say, balconies where there's, you know, potentially rim joists and you have to go in between each joist. Uh, so, again, pre-stripping simplifies it, but it is, it is certainly possible. Um, and so that, that, would be, that would be the approach I'd use. It's kind of one, one coordination step, certainly. Maybe a detached garage instead. No, that's, that's too, it's a, it's a big jump, but. Uh, my colleague, uh, Sapir Forshani at the City of Richmond is providing a comment with regard to that question about uh, the mid uh, construction score. Uh, Sapir notes that uh, City of Richmond, um, because 
collect both mid construction um, uh, test scores and the as built scores. Uh, this data suggests about a 25% gain after the drywall is right. installed. That means that if your final target is three ACH, your mid construction test should not exceed four as a rule of thumb. Next right. question. Uh, next question. Um, do you suggest taping all wood joins on the sheathing before we put on wrap like Tyvek? If so, what's the best tape for this? Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it unless it's the air tightness approach. You know, we're not having to add more steps. The conventional taped exterior sheathing, you know, Tyvek with, with tuck tape or whatever else we're product or the product we're using on the outside, that that's sufficient, you know, for most air tightness approaches, at least when we're talking about step two, one, two, three, four, well, potentially four, maybe four and five, there's some 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 more steps involved. Um, unless we're dealing with an airtight sheathing. And in that case, um, proprietary products for the sheathing itself, we've seen zip sheathing. It's not as common here, but it's becoming a bit more common or uh, a very, uh, uh, you know, a, a solid plywood or, or OSB with the perimeter sealed with, uh, you know, uh, Sega is an, an example of a high quality, uh, you know, flexible acrylic tape that, that we know sticks to wood and becomes the air tightness uh, or air, airtight seal. Excellent. What are your thoughts on air sealant spray? Right, so there's the, the product, I think it's Aero Barrier. Um, from my perspective, we've seen that it does work as a way to improve air tightness and, and achieve air tightness even, but I haven't seen it enough in person to know how it, you know, how it acts if we're t talking about large scale construction projects. Um, in general, we prefer to have details that are, uh, you know, intentionally airtight, viewable, sealed, you know, sealant tape, very much airtight components uh, that make up the air barrier rather than relying on these aerosolized um, seal approach, if that's what we're referring to. Um, so it does work, but like I said, you know, a, a, an inten intentional air barrier right from the get-go is, is generally how we approach it. Uh, are there any liquid application house wraps? If so, any recommendations? Yeah, there are, but the, the generally commercial grade at this point, um, we, we've we seen, while well, Tyvek has one, it's not necessarily as available around here. Uh, I would recommend maybe talking to a company called Cascade Aquatech. Um, there's products from uh, GE um, and, uh, and even Tremco. So it's a liquid applied, it goes onto the exterior face of the sheathing. You have to be careful with this product because it's it relies on reinforcing at joints because it can't span, you know, um, wood sheathing joints without some sort of fabric in there. It's kind of like a urethane, um, but it's it's usually silicone. It's a different material. Uh, and so, yeah, it's very much the commercial market. It's entering some of the other markets because of its effectiveness. And if you get good at it, then it's, you know, it's it's nice to be able to spray, spray it on. But, uh, but yeah. Uh, what is the best air barrier solution for a thick wall? For example, a, a two by eight or thicker wall. Right. This brings up the question of some of the, the hydrothermal considerations for the air tightness approach. The fact is, simply put, if we have an effective air barrier, technically, it doesn't matter where it is in the building because it's stopping airflow from exiting the building or entering the building. But if we have a wall assembly that has inc more insulation inside, there is a potential risk that there's convective airflow within that that stud space. And so for that reason, what we generally recommend is regardless of the air barrier approach, and, you know, in general, we do it on the outside anyways, we also, you know, put the same amount of effort as we would have with poly using as, you know, using a, a relatively, we call it kind of an, a secondary air control layer inside so that we are, we have almost, you know, two air barriers, but, but that is, that is always the case regardless of where the actual air barrier is intended to be. And like I said, now, on the outside, sheathing membrane still works um, and potentially something on the inside. I'll, I'll just quickly zoom back to that in this picture right here. This is a double stud wall. An example here, it's packed with insulation to make sure that, you know, you've got your stopping airflow in there and then it's not shown, but we, we, we also have a, a sealed poly inside. If you want to learn more about that, I, you know, I, I don't have time to get into the hydrothermal considerations for thicker walls. Um, I would say that 
ex thinking about exterior insulation as a, especially a future ready approach to say step one is you know a few inches not a few sorry step step two or three is a few inches and then we, we're ready for the thicker insulation farther down the road without having to change too much compared to thicker interior insulation that you know adds a lot of framing I'll, that's all i'll say about that i've got one last quick question um is black paper inferior quality compared to tyvek from a moisture control, black paper is fantastic. Asphalt paper we know has worked for decades and decades, but it's not airtight. And so if we're using an airtight sheathing membrane, we're not using asphalt impregnated black, you know, black paper, typical black paper. We're dealing with um well, you know, it's the it's a spun generally used uh, is spun bonded poly polyolefin is the kind of scientific term for it. It's the Tyvek you're used to, highly durable. You can uh, moisture can travel through it, but air stops. Black paper doesn't do that. Works from a moisture perspe perspective, um, but but not but not air. Fantastic, James. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you've answered um, all the questions we've got right here, on. and I will turn it over to Sapir. Excellent.